To travel through Canada by train is to discover the country the way the first explorers and settlers did, by land and along great rivers, through lakes, hills, and mountains. Great railways bind this vast country from sea to sea, and along their winding routes there is much to explore. Our journey begins in Atlantic Canada, from the rocky shores of Nova Scotia to the rugged coast of Newfoundland and the remote islands of the St. Lawrence. Our railway adventures take us on the Brodeur through Cape Breton, along the old trails of Newfoundland, through Nova Scotia on the ocean, and into the Gaspé Peninsula on the Chaleur. Our entree to Atlantic Canada is at Halifax, which boasts the world's second largest natural harbor. The city began as a British garrison in 1749. Once ever watchful of the French fortress at Louisbourg near Sydney. Nowadays, the Brodeur, a summertime rail excursion, links these two historic cities. Nova Scotia, the very name means New Scotland. And with its rugged highlands, it was aptly named by Scottish Highlanders who found sanctuary in a land that felt so much like home. For some travelers, riding the Brodeur is a way to reconnect with their roots. I've always been fascinated with Nova Scotia and uh, Cape Breton Island. I didn't realize that Cape Breton Island was um, a, a separate part of Nova Scotia. That's why I chose to come on the train. And my heritage is uh, Ireland and Scotland, so it, it speaks to my soul. It's a unique way to see this part of Cape Breton especially because the rail line travels through an area that would not normally be traveled by people traveling from the Strait area to, to the Sydneys or on to Lewisburg. Good morning folks. Did you get for a copy of the newspaper? Got it? Would you like to have the provincial edition? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Get caught up on the local news? Yeah. Folks are okay? For passengers catching the train, an early morning wake-up call comes with a morning newspaper and breakfast wrapped in Nova Scotia tartan. The route from Halifax to Sydney threads its way through towns and villages settled by early pioneers. At Grand Narrows, the train passes over the Canso Causeway. Some 50 years ago, millions of tons of rock were hewn from Cape Porcupine to link Cape Breton Island forever to the mainland. Just after crossing St. Peter's Canal, it's time to stretch your legs and perhaps do a little shopping at Port Hawkesbury. The Brodeur rumbles on through Orangedale, the last original intercolonial railway station house left in Canada. In its heyday, it was one of the busiest stations on Cape Breton Island. The station we're standing in now was uh, built in 1886. On the first floor would be the uh, station master's office and the waiting room and uh, then the uh, visitor can go upstairs and see where the station master lived.
The sun has begun its westward trek as the train rounds Brador, the world's largest saltwater lake. Over the Grand Narrows Railway Bridge and 11 hours after leaving Halifax, the train arrives in Sydney. Centuries before Scottish Highlanders settled Cape Breton, the French were here at a lonely coastal outpost called Louisbourg. The fortress of Louisbourg, one of Canada's finest historic sites, was built in the early 1700s to guard the Gulf of St. Lawrence and protect France's dwindling empire in the New World. Lewisburg's stone walls are three meters thick and nine meters high and bristle with 148 cannon. Strolling this magnificent reconstruction is to step back into the 18th century, but Lewisburg's time on the world stage was brief. The French fort was soon captured by the British and control went back and forth between the two superpowers until finally England built its own garrison, Halifax. Nova Scotia would soon become home to the United Empire Loyalists, as thousands of supporters of the British cause fled the American Revolution. Many Loyalists were Americans of British descent. Others were French Huguenots, Dutch, and German. Over the years, many blacks would seek refuge because of Canada's anti-slavery laws. The multicultural pattern of Canadian immigration had begun. Atlantic Canada's maritime history and the stunning scenery come together in the village of Peggy's Cove. The rugged little fishing community nestles in a narrow ocean inlet, dominated by a lighthouse high atop granite boulders. Legend has it that the cove was named for Peggy, the lone survivor of a shipwreck who married one of the local inhabitants. It's an artist's and photographer's mecca William de Garth, who was born in 1907 in Finland, came to Peggy's Cove in 1926 and during his lifetime carved these granite rocks into a living monument to Canadian fishermen. Between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, the power of the sea rules life in the Bay of Fundy, where the highest tides in the world are generated. The mouth of the Bay of Fundy between Yarmouth and Bar Harbor, Maine, is 90 miles across. Between Digby and St. John, it's 45 miles across. And a Cape Split is five miles across. So you have all this water rushing in into a funnel-shaped bay. And it has nowhere to go but up. The same thing is happening here on this river. And the water is forcing up into a narrower river all the time, you see. And this is what creates a bore. When we first saw it coming around the bend, traveling approximately 10 miles an hour. Just a ferry or flight away from Nova Scotia is St. John's, the heart and capital of Newfoundland. The trains may be gone, but their historic rail beds have been preserved as walking trails. You'll also need sturdy walking shoes for the hills and steps of St. John's and its historic harbor. We have about 500 years of history and culture and tradition. So it's quite old in, in terms of its tradition and its makeup. Um, but the water was, was key, it was all important and, and it was the heart of why we were here. A tradition started by early settlers has left its mark on this city's colorful architecture, like Elaine Han's grand old home. The wind blew the paint off the house last year, so you have to paint it again this year. So really it's painted with whatever they had at the time. So what you had then was a hodgepodge of color that was actually part of the charm of the city. Along St. John's Grand Concourse are trails that lead through many of its heritage buildings, churches, and cathedrals.
some trails lead to Signal Hill. You don't want to be too faint of heart, but this, uh, this trail here is called the North Head Trail, and it actually begins at the base of the hill and will come right around the face, and there will be a series of steps that will take you right back up to the top of the hill and to Cabot Tower. And from there, you can see Fort Amherst, the Newfoundland's first lighthouse, which has guarded the Narrows for two centuries. Another lighthouse at Cape Spear, the most easterly point of land in North America, has been guiding mariners in and out of St. John's Harbor for more than 160 years. If the soul of Newfoundland is in its people, then the spirit is in George Street. Well, George Street is known um, because it's a, it's a very small street, but it has the uh, largest number of bars per capita than anywhere else in North America. You can have um, a drink in, in a pub where you, you will hear traditional Newfoundland live entertainment, and you can go and have a scuff and a good time. <laughs> The trains may be gone, but the terminus building remains, though the maid of industry had little to do once the railway was decommissioned in 1991. In 1997, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador turned the old rail bed into a provincial park. The cleverly named Newfoundland Trailway Provincial Park is a 900-kilometer trail that winds across Newfoundland from St. John's to Port of Basque. Another branch of the railroad, south around the Avalon Peninsula, is a hiking trail. And a scenic drive around the Irish Loop, as it's called, takes you to Bay Bulls, where you can cruise out to see Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve's millions of seabirds. Puffins aren't really designed, you see, for flying. Puffins aren't supposed to fly, technically. Uh, their wings are too small for their bodies. But sometimes they eat so much that they can't take flight. They're skipping across the top of the water. And uh, it's really, it's quite comical. And they try to take off and they just go flat on their face back in the water. Hiking the East Coast Trail leads you around the Avalon Peninsula into places like La Manche, once a fishing port, now a ghost town. In the 1960s, during the era of resettlement in Newfoundland, La Manche was deserted. A lot of what was left was washed away a few years later by a rogue wave. This house would, would have been owned by a family that fished here you know, from the 30s on up, but no one's been living here, I'd say, since the, the early 60s. So it's just kind of fallen down. Every year when I come out here, it gets a little bit more dilapidated. But an hour south of St. John's is a coastal community of Fairyland and the colony of Avalon. It's here that archaeologists are uncovering the remains of Lord Baltimore's settlement with finds that date back to 1621. Somebody's always finding something when you're here because we find something every few seconds, really, when the full gang is on. Just this, this spring, one of the fellows, Barry Galton, found a little tiny thimble that belonged to a child, a sewing thimble. And we don't often find very many objects that we can associate with children. Satisfied with that? At the bottom of the Irish Loop, the landscape changes dramatically, and it's not unusual to come across a herd of caribou and even the occasional moose. The building of railway lines also opened up recreational areas in Newfoundland. People used to ride the rail to access cabin areas, access berry picking areas, hunting areas, and by maintaining and preserving uh, the trailway as a provincial park, we're still preserving those traditional types of lifestyles. In the fall, I usually 
do a little rabbit catching along the line. You can do anything here. It's easy going. Uh, the only thing you have to watch out for is loose rock in some places where the rock is not packed down right. Otherwise, it's as good as the highway. Just off the trailway on the west coast of Newfoundland is Grossmore National Park with its coastal lowlands bordering the Gulf of St. Lawrence and an alpine plateau in the Long Range Mountains. The rocks in Grossmoren is, are as old as 600 million years. There's uh, uh, lots of evidence of ancient volcanoes, and uh, there's also ancient seas have been here. So wonderful place for, for fossils. Grossmoren is now a World Heritage Site, primarily because of the number of geological features in the park. We have the tablelands, which are uh, peridotite. It's effectively uh, that part of the, the continent that's normally in contact with molten lava flipped upside down. So where you had the calcium and the nitrogen coming out in the groundwater, you have the lush vegetation that you see here. Uh, areas where there are a few springs, you get little low-growing, ground-hogging uh, plants that can tolerate the high magnesium and iron, and, and they're more like Arctic alpine species. As a consequence, uh, this is a very diverse place. Even though it's uh, part of the boreal forest, which ordinarily isn't all that diverse, in Gross Morn, you can see all kinds of things from different uh, ecological zones. And so to me, that's what's special about it. In the far north of Newfoundland, at Lanso Meadows, you'll also find solid evidence of Vikings. This World Heritage Site marks the lonely outpost of the first Europeans to set foot in North America more than a thousand years ago. It's the only authenticated Viking settlement in North America. And um, also on the site, we have the remains of eight buildings. Also on the site, we have uh, four reconstructed sod buildings. We have the longhouse and a workshop and a smithy and a storage building whereby people can go in these houses and see what the actual remains would have looked like a thousand years ago. Archaeological digs in the 1960s uncovered this bronze ring-headed pin, as well as butternuts which helped crack the mystery of the Nordic colony of Vinland. Butternuts grow in northern New Brunswick, which is the same place where they would have been able to find grapes. So we think that Lansa Meadows is a gateway to Vinland, whereby they built their base camp, but they also explored further south, uh, where they would have been able to harvest the timber, grapes, and, and butternuts. So Vinland is a region as opposed to one small place on the map. At a nearby replica settlement called Norstead, costume guides really take you back in time. My name is Egil Kvel Ulf, Egil the Evening Wolf. With a face like this, you can see why, can't you? I'm making cups or bowls. It's made of uh, it's birch wood. This is Caitlin. It's been salted and dry. Uh, The Vikings did not live in a lot of comfort, and a thousand years later, railway passengers sometimes had to bunk down at the station. But for today's traveler, there are places like Strawberry Hill. Beyond the barren mounds at Lanso Meadows, you may meet a baby berg near the shore at Iceberg Alley. Bon voyage. Icebergs come in sizes. A bergy bit is like a small car. A growler like this one is smaller, about the size of a grand piano. Okay, now that we've seen the calf, we'll go see the mother. 
So one day you can come around a corner and all of a sudden there's this massive berg there. Someone referred to them one time as vast cathedrals of ice. And they look different every day because they're rolling over, they're breaking apart, they've got colors in them. You get the light behind them and you see that almost like winter green or bright blue coming through them. It's hard to imagine that this impressive mountain of fresh water is just one small chunk off the massive glaciers from Greenland and the Arctic. From a kayak, it's possible to explore the iceberg from almost every angle. But because they can be somewhat unstable, it's wise to keep your distance. Imagine what you see is only one-tenth of what's beneath the surface. And imagine what it would have been like for sailors trying to navigate through icebergs, islands, and the rocky shores of Newfoundland. The lighthouse itself was opened in the 1860s, and it's been staffed since then. The present house was built in 1922, the main inn. This is a great spot for icebergs, and this is the tip of what they call Iceberg Alley. It's where all the icebergs come down the coast of Labrador and then spread out along the north and east coast of Newfoundland, and we're at the top of that. So the icebergs stay here long into the season. For another uniquely Newfoundland experience, try Jig's Dinner. It's a raw food meal. It's very filling, and but it's tasty. It's a meal that all Newfoundlanders grew up with, right? The main day for it being served was on Sunday, and today is Sunday, so you've hit on the right day to have a Newfoundland dinner. Carrots, cabbage, potatoes, salted beef, it all goes into one pot and boils up together. And another crucial ingredient is peas pudding. No trip to Newfoundland is complete without a fresh seafood dinner. Start with some tender cod tongues, then lobster fixed in many ways, from stew to spring rolls, not to mention the old favorite, boiled lobster with lemon butter for dipping. Newfoundland is covered with wild berries, so it's not surprising they pop up in many different dishes. Yeah, there's a, a local berry, and it's a delicacy. You only find it in certain kinds of bogs. Locally, it's called bake apples. It has nothing to do with apples and, and nothing to do with being baked. I don't know where the name came from. It looks more almost like a, almost like a brown raspberry more than anything else. In other areas, it's known as a cloudberry, and from that, you make a liqueur. Some of the trains that used to take Newfoundlanders to their best berry picking spots can be seen now in Cornerbrook at the Humberside Rail Museum, where Brendan Dix, a former engineer, is the curator. We have the only steam engine that's uh, available on the island. It's inoperative, but it's the only steam engine left alive. And we have the only working diesel electric locomotive, which is a 1200 horsepower General Motors uh, diesel electric. The dining car is still set for lunch, and the sleeping berth looks as if someone bunked there last night. When the last train stopped here at the railroad town of Humbermouth, all the railroad employees stood beside the tracks to watch the passing of the railway in Newfoundland. Nowadays, a train journey across Canada starts in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the eastern seaport, where so many immigrants first set foot. They disembarked at Pier 21, which is now a museum and a testament to the immigrant experience. People would be unloaded into this room here, and also they would be processed, welcome into Canada, and then at the end of that process, we could take, you know, anywhere from two hours to eight hours in length, depending on the number of people on the ship and so on. You would uh, get your supplies for the train ride across Canada. Immigrants arriving in the 1930s would still face a long overland journey to Saskatchewan and Alberta at Pier 21, you can cross Canada in minutes. Well, the train exhibit offers people a glimpse into what it may have been like for immigrants who would have gone on to the train. It's a 10-minute train ride across Canada. It starts in Halifax, ends in Vancouver. Immigrants weren't the only ones facing an uncertain future. It was also very important with World War II because all of the troops um, left Canada to, from Pier 21 to fight overseas in Europe. And they all came by train. You can still stay at the original train hotel, 
Although it's undergone a few renovations, additions, and name changes since it was built in 1930. The lobby has changed a bit, but it's still very reminiscent of the original hotel. And if you go into our promenade lounge, the ceiling work with all of the, uh, the copper leafing and such is still the same, and it's fabulous. Passengers often overnight here before boarding the ocean, the longest running passenger train in Canadian history. In the heady days of immigration, the ocean traveled all the way across Canada. Passengers get on the train at Halifax Station, and once on board, you're en route through Nova Scotia to New Brunswick. At the mouth of the Petticodiac River in New Brunswick, these small islands only appear at high tide. Over the millennia, the 15-meter tides that surge up the Bay of Fundy have sculpted the soft rock into what look like flower pots atop reddish pillars in the Rocks Provincial Park. Fundy is hill country. Uh, hills going up to 366 uh, meters or 1,200 feet above sea level. So all of Fundy is uh, rugged topography, uh, steep hills, uh, deep river valleys, fast flowing rivers, waterfalls, all going down to the uh, Bay of Fundy shoreline. <laughs> Mary's Point Shorebird Reserve puts on a kind of air show. Birds on their annual migration swoop through in amazing flying formations. When they have completed the uh, uh, nesting um, in the uh, Arctic, then they pass through here in hundreds of thousands. We call them sandpipers, but there are about 10 different species of those birds. They stop for about 10 days and they feed, and they get fed, and they fuel up, because then from here, right from this point, they fly from 40 to 60 hours nonstop to South America. Listening to the birds, it's easy to understand how the nearby Tantramar marshes got their names, from the French Tantamar, meaning uproar. These marshes, called the world's biggest hayfield, are protected from the sea by dikes built by 17th century Acadian settlers. Tantramar uh, was settled as early as 1672 by a gentleman named Jacques Bourgeois who came with five families and um, the, the Acadian population of this area grew until, until the deportation in, in 1755. Here at Fort Beausejour, you can appreciate the tremendous isolation under which the Acadians lived. Caught between the ongoing British and French wars, the Acadians refused to take sides. But the British, not convinced of their neutrality, deported them. The majority ended up in the French colony of Louisiana, where they became known as Cajuns. They say Prince Edward Island is no longer an island ever since the Confederation Bridge was thrown across the Northumberland Straits. 
Like Newfoundland, only the railway right-of-way remains. 275 kilometers of track that once linked North Cape with East Point has now been converted into the Confederation Trail. The trail is aptly named, for it was here in Charlottetown, the capital of Canada's smallest and most densely populated province, that Confederation was conceived. The idea of joining the colonies of British North America was tied to the dream of building a transcontinental railroad. This would be key to the future, vital for trade and Western settlement, and crucial in the defense against a growing threat from the Americans. In 1864, Upper and Lower Canada learned that the Atlantic provinces might form their own union. So a delegation boarded the Queen Victoria, along with $13,000 worth of champagne, and set sail for Prince Edward Island to be met by a single oyster boat. It seems their arrival was eclipsed by the first ever visit of the circus. In spite of their low-key welcome, the Ottawa delegation persevered, and the bans of matrimony were proclaimed. Three years later, a nation was born. From nation building in Charlottetown to a national park on the north side of the province. Here, some of North America's finest white sand beaches fringe the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The park is renowned for its great dune lands, salt marshes, and freshwater ponds. Within its boundaries can be found Green Gables, the farmhouse immortalized by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Her mother died when she was 22 months old. And then from there, she was taken down to her Cavendish home and raised by her grandparents, the McNeils, down in uh, Cavendish. And what I always argue, that she had to have that loneliness in Cavendish to write. And people have said they'd see her at 3 or 4 in the morning roaming the fields. I suppose she's getting books together with characters thought out. Well, I think Anne, as, she, as Lucy Maud says herself, is her imagination, based on certain real things that happened to her in her life. But Anne is a creation of Lucy Maud Montgomery's mind. Prince Edward Island is really a beautiful province, the most beautiful place in America, I believe. Elsewhere are more lavish landscapes and grander scenery, but for chaste, restful loveliness, it is unsurpassed. Compassed by the inviolate sea, it floats on the waves of the Blue Gulf, a green seclusion and haunt of ancient peace. Returning to New Brunswick, we rejoin the ocean train at Moncton and head for Cushy Bourgeois National Park. There's so much within the province of New Brunswick. Certainly the uh, southeast uh, coast of New Brunswick, which has uh, the beaches and shorelines and the natural uh, habitats, which have gone relatively undiscovered for many, many years. And the reason Fujibukwak National Park was established to preserve uh, that part of Canada's heritage, uh, the barrier island system. Uh, it's basically uh, a nursery for uh, many of the, of the uh, fish and uh, small organisms that, that live along this coast and many of the birds and seals and, and other organisms uh, feed on. dunes are a very fragile system and uh, it's uh, maintained by marum grass. The dunes also provide an ideal nesting area for the terns. The 
Natives, people of the First Nations, fished in these waters and they camped along these coasts and they traveled and, and transported goods and supplies inland through the river systems. And then later came the Acadians who settled along the coast. The history of the Acadians is on display at Le Pays de la Seguine, an interpretive center and showcase for the literary works of Antonine Maillet. Et they created Le Pays de la Saguine, a theme park for, to underline the, uh, the works of Antonin Maillet, which is an international Acadian author. Antonin Maillet uh, is a woman that's solidly connected to her roots, Acadian roots. You don't erase history, but I've always felt that being part of that ethnic group, you know, uh, was good for me, and I have always been proud of it. And I've always appreciated the efforts that our great, great, great parents made to survive. From Rogersville, the ocean train runs north to Matapedia, where you can connect with the Chaleur and travel along the southern shores of the Gaspé Peninsula. Tucked between Nouvelle and Carleton is Parc de Miguasha recently added to the list of World Heritage Sites. This is the Prince of Miguasha, the fossilized fish that helped paleontologists understand the evolution from fish to amphibian. Almost 400 million years ago in the Devonian period, there were no amphibians, no reptiles or mammals. When the transition from water to land occurred, it left behind, right here, evidence of each stage of that remarkable development. It's a paleo ecosystem that has been preserved. We have the fish, we have the fern, we have the invertebrate, we have scorpions, we have water scorpions, we have traces of worms. So the whole ecosystem is buried in Miguasha, and it's only eight kilometers long. So can you imagine of all the surface of the earth, eight kilometers only of Miguasha, we comprehend how a fish evolve into a tetrapod. <laughs> so we're still looking for an animal with a five-finger hand or even six-finger. I wouldn't mind the sixth one, but it has to have legs. <laughs> Walking on land. Guarding the eastern end of the Gaspé Peninsula is Perse Rock, a great block of limestone rising 86 meters out of the sea. Nearby on Bonaventure Island lives the world's largest colony of gannets.
talking about a bird brain, but a very smart bird brain with a little computer that knows exactly where it's, it's nesting along these, these 60,000 gannets. While they're flying in, they'll call, and the one that's sitting on the nesting site will answer. And for us, it's all the same, ra, 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 continually. But for them, it's different patterns of calling, so even the neighbor gets to, to know who's coming in. Parc National Forillon stands at the tip of the Gaspé Peninsula. We have a very popular event here that we've been uh, doing for uh, 17 years now brings people into contact, a direct contact with what's living in the sea in Forio. We dive oh, we for the public who stays uh, on the beach, and we go and pick up specimens uh, that uh, live uh, to about 100 meters from the shore, and bring back uh, these specimens to aquaria that are on the beach, an aquarium for every, for every group. And uh, the naturalist there explains what uh, these animals are about and how they, how they mate and how they, how they eat and who preys on whom. We feel it's our job to uh, build up an awareness that we don't know much about what's living in the sea around, uh, around our country. Most things that we know are just concerning the, uh, the species that we fish commercially whereas all the rest of the wildlife has an important also. The dramatic scenery of winter in the Gaspé Peninsula attracts photographers and adventurers. Limestone cliffs plunge into the sea at Forillon. Inland, the McGarrickles and the Chickchocks stand tall as eastern Canada's highest mountains. The unusual vegetation is a curious mix of boreal forest and alpine plants, more often found in subarctic conditions. For French, Canada is like a dream, because of the land, because of the space. So my two friends of France come uh, to rejoin me in Montreal. In Gaspésie, in France, is very known by an interest of tourism. So we decided to, to make the a trip in Gaspésie, and uh, we chose this morning because of, of the snow, the snowfall done this, uh, this night. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful trip. And for many locals and visitors, it is here in these parks that winter comes alive. Snowmobilers explore almost 7,000 kilometers of dedicated trails. And for the very daring, try scaling a wall of ice. Plenty of snow means you can ski from the end of November to mid-April. Diehards have even found snow at the top of Mont Albert in the Parc de la Gaspésie in July. The park is mainly a wooded area, but uh, there's about 20 summits which reach over 1,000 meters. Most of those summits are bare, so people can reach easily bare ground and with it enjoy skiing in the natural snow field. And at the end of the day, relax in the heart of the Parc de la Gaspésie at one of the many comfortable inns.
Between the parks, you'll see a number of famous landmarks. In the spring, a flight from Gaspé takes you to the Magdalen Islands. From there, by helicopter, you reach the ice flows of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where seal pups are spending their first few days of life. First thing you should do when you get there is take it all in. You know, the, 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 the landscape, the scenery is totally different. You're on sea ice. The, the noise, the wind blowing, the seals crying. Get the atmosphere first, and then start taking pictures if you want. But just enjoy the first half hour. It's worth it. It's a unique wildlife experience. It's very fantastic. You're, you're in a, a nursery ground for, for seals. You know, nowhere else on Earth can you do something like that. It's only possible because winter pack ice forms in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Each year, around the end of February, thousands of pregnant harp seals haul themselves out of the water onto the ice. They'll find some roughly contoured ice that provides shelter from the frigid winds and give birth. When they're first born, the, the harp seals are yellowish and very skinny. They start putting uh, fat very rapidly. They grow about two kilograms per day. The Magdalens are a relatively unknown part of Quebec. In the 16th century, Jacques Cartier wrote the first accounts of this archipelago. Along the string of 12 islands, seven are inhabited, and most of these are connected by long, narrow sand dunes. All in all, 300 kilometers of the best beaches in Canada. La Grave is an important historic site on the islands. The town's name comes from the French word grève, which means pebbly and sandy beach. La Grave has its share of trendy cafes where you can meet the locals, Les Madelinots. The Magdalen Islands have a reputation for excellent cuisine, much of it based naturally on the sea. Ocean perch, the flounder, the cod, the crab, the sea snails. Of course, all from the islands uh, and the vegetables too, especially in summertime. La Grave's main street is lined with craft and souvenir shops where artists like France Pinchot are eager to talk about their work. I take mold from natural seashells I find here on the beaches, and then with the mold, I can reproduce them in sterling or in gold. One of the most popular designs are the sand dollars because it's rare to find them here, and when we find them, we say it's a lucky charm. So it's always the favorite uh, pieces for the people who visit the Magdalen Islands. There's no shortage of nautical themes. Perhaps the most famous studio on the islands is Les Artisans du Sable, the artists of the sand. We use only natural sands. We don't dye the sand, and we have uh, many, many colors. 
We start by mixing the sand with a kind of glue, and we make blocks. And after about an hour, an hour and a half, the block is solid. And we can work on it. We can turn it on a wood lathe. We can sculpt it. Like if it was a piece of wood. The sands of the island are also turned into glass at La Meduse. Indoors and outdoors, the Magdalene Islands, Les Îles de la Madeleine, charm visitors and inspire artists with a glorious palette of colors. The Magdalene's red rock cliffs are best seen from offshore in a zodiac. Or, if you're up to it, in a sea kayak. We have all type of tourism, but most of the people that come here are very nature oriented, which is very good because we don't want to have big condominiums here. You know, it's a virgin place and we want to keep it that way. You can fly back to Gaspé and return on the Chaleur train to Matapédia for a different perspective on all the historic and cultural sites that make this peninsula so intriguing. Over the trestles, through the towns, and alongside the Gulf of St. Lawrence, to the junction of two great rivers, the Metapedia and the Restigouche, where some of the finest salmon in the world is caught. I started at 12 years old. This is my 70th summer. Guiding. I've been guiding on the Restigouche maybe 18 years or so, and on the Metapedia for over 50 years. Most of the Americans came here first and built the camps over 100 years ago. I started guiding the president of the IP. R.J. Cullen, John Hinman, this girl's father-in-law, and so on, and Jimmy Carter, and, and doctors and lawyers. We give them the, all the same service. If it's a girl, we give, them a, give her a few more smiles. One of these camps, Estevan Lodge, was built on the banks of the Métis River in 1886 by the controversial president of the CPR, Stephen George. He later gave the property to his niece, Elsie Reeford, who designed a magnificent garden that benefits from the unusual microclimate created by the humid air rising from the junction of the St. Lawrence and Métis rivers. Himalayan blue poppies, rhododendrons, azaleas, and gentians share space with a thousand other indigenous and exotic species. At Jardin de Métis, spring flowers bloom long after their season has officially ended.
Right where the St. Lawrence River spills into the Gulf, there are isolated refuges like Quarry and Anticosti Islands. Quarry Island is interesting for birds, but also uh, because of the rock formations, the uh, monoliths that you find there. I travel around the world and I didn't see a place, uh, I mean a natural place, with such unusual, with such unusual rocks and uh, natural place. It also has a different types of different types of environment like peat bog and uh, boreal forest, so that's interesting. And then there's Anticosti. It's 220 kilometers long, 56 kilometers wide. You know, right in the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, you have 270 people living there, 120,000 deer, about 27 salmon rivers. There's such an immense property there, and so few people and uh, a lot of wildlife. Here at Boreal Falls, over tens of thousands of years, this small stream has carved a fantastic canyon through the rock. Then it's back to Ramuski to reconnect with the ocean and board the overnight train to North America's jewel of historic treasures, Quebec City, to continue your railway adventures across Canada.